television highlights of the news of yesteryear. Worst sham of the century, Neville Chamberlain, unwitting victim of the worthless Munich Agreement, prepares to meet Hitler and Mussolini and save Czechoslovakia. Along with Delagier of France, Britain's Prime Minister arrives in Munich for a conclave which was to prove the fallacy of appeasement. Hitler's demands for the Sudetenland were granted upon promise of no further territorial claims by Germany. It's September 30th, 1938, and Mussolini signs for Italy, followed by Dalajay for France. By the terms of the agreement, one-fifth of Czechoslovakia comes under the German flag. Bitterly protested by the Czechs, nevertheless, the agreement by Chamberlain, which he believed would avert all-out war, was hailed in London on its arrival from the conference. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. En route to the palace, Chamberlain stopped at 10 Downing Street, where he declared, I believe it is peace for our time. On the palace balcony with their majesties, the King and Queen of England, the Prime Minister is cheered upon the success of his mission. But in the Sudetenland, Czechoslovakians accepted the first German troops with a skepticism born of distrust for Germany. On October 5th, Czech President Benesch resigned. And while a short welcome was made when Hitler arrived, despair was in the hearts of the people. Even as the Nazi dictator inspects the fruits of his diplomatic victory, analysts the world over were speculating on his next move. This was the British-French concession to the Fuhrer. This was the concession which was to fan the flame of world domination in Hitler cause him to break the Munich Pact, arouse the world to combat, and result in his eventual destruction. It's 1928, and work begins on the largest structure of its kind ever attempted by man, the Boulder Dam over the Colorado River. Thousands of men gather to begin work on the $165 million project, which will back up a lake 160 miles with the shoreline 550 miles around. The base of the dam, when completed, will be 650 feet thick with a height of over 730 feet. Workmen scale away loose rocks from the cliffs landing the site, and the eight years that follow see portions of the dam completed in sections. The turbulent Colorado River has been harnessed. All that remains now is addition of finishing touches and closing of the huge dam gate. Here will be the largest artificial lake ever built. And now preparations are made to permit the Colorado to come in. Workmen are finishing. The dam gate is lowered. And here comes the Colorado. In three months, the water will climb to the top of the gate. And now the lake has been formed. Arizona and Nevada have joined in this tremendous project. And even far off Los Angeles benefits from the electricity generated. Completed in 1936, Boulder, by Act of Congress in 1947, was renamed Hoover Dam in honor of the president during whose term it was started. This is Hoover Dam. Historic flight of the Southern Cross, Oakland, California, 1928. An airman under Captain Charles Kingsford Smith on the end are about to take off for Australia. Destination is Sydney, with scheduled stops in Hawaii, Fiji Islands, and New Zealand. Kingsford Smith and his gallant aides wing their way toward the first conquering of the Pacific by air. 24 hours later, the Southern Cross had landed in Honolulu, then 3,138 miles to Sava and Fiji, and then on to Australia. Nearing Sydney, the Southern Cross has completed 83 hours in the air and has flown a distance of 7,389 miles. Cheers for Kingsford Smith and his crew, C.P. Elm, co-pilot, Captain Harry Lyon, American navigator, and James Warner of Kansas. The Southern Cross made it. It's 
memory time, friends. Recall when this young lady was Ziegfeld's top singing star? You should. It's Ruth Edding, of course. Never to be forgotten for her singing of Ten Cents a Dance, Chicago artist Raymond Katz honors Miss Edding, who has been named by the Chicago Artists Association as the stage personality with most pulchritude, boys, and personality. This is Ruth Edding. It's midway through World War I, and Douglas Fairbanks turns Liberty Bond Salesman. Aiding Fairbanks in the drive is Charlie Chaplin, who deserts the band for bond selling, aided by a megaphone and his famous derby. The star of Easy Street, The Rink, The Kid, and dozens of other laugh-provoking films, together with the dashing Doug, sold millions of dollars in bonds. celebrates as April 26, 1923 sees the royal wedding of the Duke of York, second oldest son of King George V and Queen Mary. Traditional costumes and setting mark the festivities as the Duke is driven to Westminster Abbey, where his marriage to Lady Elizabeth Bowles Lyon is to be solemnized. The bride, daughter of the 14th Earl of Strathmore, is to become Queen of England years later, with two daughters blessing a union that begins this day. Wedding guests wait to honor the royal couple outside Westminster Abbey. Ceremony completed, the Duke and Duchess of York, amid the pomp and splendor befitting royal marriage, drive through London streets en route to Buckingham Palace. Cheering thousands line the way, hailing the wedding procession. Here it passes through historic Trafalgar Square. The gates of Buckingham Palace open for the advance guard, and later, on the palace balcony, flanked by King George V and Queen Mary, the Duke of York, who will be King George VI, and his bride, who will be Queen Elizabeth, receive the homage of their subjects. It's hats on when a lady's present in 1914, and this creation's a veiled sailor with flowered bands and side tilt. One down, but more to go in a moment. Let's see what this new chapeau is like. It features an off-the-face brim trimmed with white birds and has a sailor crown. Off the face is off the head. What's coming up now? This round brim cloche is trimmed with black feathers. Very popular in the millinery mode of that moment. And now for a look at the cartwheel hat with gathered fabric and box crown. Somehow, I don't believe she's going to like this either. See what I mean? But, madame, there must be something you'll want. Now, I just happen to have one that's exactly right for your personality. It's an off-the-face profile brim and straw trimmed with plumes. But off with the old, on with the new. And finally, a flowered cloche. This suits my lady's fancy. Mighty fancy. These are New York's earliest trolleys, but we are going to move to 1916 and a big transit strike looms as thousands of trolley workers decide to walk out unless demands are met by traction companies. Cooper Square Business Center will be hard hit and wire screen trolleys take off to supply transportation. Jitneys make their appearance and Fifth Avenue buses are overloaded as the strike, which started in Westchester, spreads to the heart of the city. 8,000 conductors and motormen march in an attempt to influence public opinion in their behalf. But with non-striking crews operating them, other trolley cars are off down the streets of New York to make sure that Gotham doesn't have to walk just because there's been a walkout. Well, Lord blimey, if it aren't critic in dear old London, July 9th, 1920. Who's playing? Why, it's Addo and Heaton, of course. Not quite sure which is which, but don't believe the players are either, don't you know? There's a blooming run for the batsman. And off goes this bounder somewhere. 
jolly old mess, eh, what? Frankfurters and the Brooklyn Dodgers were never like this. The game? Oh, you didn't miss a thing. The Bloomin' Contest ended in a tie or something of the sort. Cheero! Back to America in 1928 to see the horse racing event of the year, the Kentucky Derby. There they go. This picture you're watching is one of the first to employ the long-range lens that enabled an entire race to be photographed. And now, here come the horses on a muddy track with misstep leading the way as they near the first turn. Get your eye on the horse in fifth place as they go into the back stretch. It's one of the really greats in racing, Ray Count. Ray Count hasn't made his bid yet as jockeys maneuver for position with the far turn coming up. Misstep is still showing its heels to the field, but wait for the turn and the home stretch. That's when Ray Count will make his move. There's the last turn. It's still misstep. And coming down the home stretch, misstep still out in front. But here comes Ray Count closing in. And just watch that horse as Jockey Lang maneuvers him over the muddy track. Ray Count strains in front, passes misstep, and moves ahead to win by three lengths and grab a $55,375 purse. What a horse. What a race. 